God's grace and peace, friends. Today's a big day here at St. Paul's as we celebrate our church carnival. Many, if you're seeing this now, probably aren't going to be here this afternoon for this or whenever it is that you watch this. But what a way to outreach. And I ask you to keep all of those people involved in the carnival for our community in prayer. It is such a wonderful thing to see and share. It's a wonderful way to celebrate the good news of Christ with all we encounter by sharing love and sharing time and sharing ourselves with the people we encounter. Today in worship, I would invite you to think about all of those different ways that you too share your faith, though maybe not with words, maybe it's actions, maybe it's with kind gestures, whatever it happens to be. Think on those things as we worship together. join me in our opening prayer. You came to live among us, Lord, knowing the fullness of human experience, starting where we yet are revealing the way to your kingdom. We give you thanks for your word and for your resurrection power bringing us into community with you. Show us how to follow you this day, to be fully here wherever you have planted us, to listen well and value whatever glimpses of others you show us, to speak the truth that we know without needing to control the outcome. We ask this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen.
Today's scripture lesson is coming from the book of Philippians in the first chapter. The Philippians is a book, an epistle, or a letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and it goes like this. From Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in each one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart for all of you who share in God's grace with me, but my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having pr- produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ, and for the most and brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of good love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel, and the others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to increase my suffering and imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, then that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. Here ends our reading. I'm going to tell you a little bit about a professor I had in seminary at Chicago Theological. His name was Tim Jennings, the, the Reverend Doctor. Tim was an old, or Ted was an old Methodist guy who when I started seminary, seemed like one of those wild and crazy professors you read about, right? Except Ted, Ted wore a leather jacket, often sleeveless, with just a t-shirt, and he'd show up to class, and you'd be kind of like, who is this fella? I had my first class in Christian thought with him my very first semester at seminary, and immediately said, this is the guy I want to be able to study with. He gets it. So he was teaching an epistles class, and I said, I want to take the epistles with Ted. And he said, we're going to sit down. Let's have a beer. And I said, okay. So I went, sat down with Ted, and I said, I want to take your class specifically because I know what I know about you, and I know the rules say that I can't take it until I've taken these other classes. And he said, so explain to me why. And I said, I remember you talking in that first class about what you did as an itinerant preacher in Mexico. He would go from village to village, to share the gospel and help and do whatever he could when he was a younger, well, much younger guy. And the stories fascinated me because I said, if someone's going to teach me about the epistles and what Paul did, I want to know it from someone who knows what that's like, to go from place to place, not having roots, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, and yet not knowing with what you did had an impact or a lasting impact or even mattered to the people. Ted said, buy me another beer. So I did. And he said, you're in my class. And I took this class, and it was fascinating. I looked at Paul in an entirely new way, not just in the philosophical senses and learning all the history and context. Super important. 
but because the way Ted talked about what it is to share with these communities that are cut off or maybe not connected with the wider world, much like they were in the time of the epistles and Paul, you start to understand a little bit differently how you interact and respond. And that's what Paul did then. Paul would go from place to place. The other disciples as well would do this and they would go and they would teach and they would gain a following, if you will, and they would plant, the word we use today, a church, a community, a a, a group of the people following the way, and they would stay with that group doing work tent, or Paul was a tent maker, so he would stay doing this, and when the church, if you will, was viable, he would depart. He would head on to the next place, and he would write letters, uh, That's one thing I honestly don't know anything about, and I did some research. There were some mail carriers. I have no idea how these letters got there unless someone carried them to these distant communities, which is likely what happened. And he would send these letters to say, hey, it's me, Paul. Remember me, Paul, who taught you, who brought you into this faith tradition that taught you about the way. And I'm writing to you to encourage you and remind you that I care and I'm thinking of you, to teach you anything new or maybe Uh, admonish some of the things you're starting to believe. My job as Paul is then to help you as a community, as it were, basically like being a pen pal pastor, if you will. And this is what happens. So Paul, after his time in other places, ends up in Philippi. We get a little bit of that in Acts, which is in Macedonia, Greece area. And he plants this church, and then he leaves because he writes this letter. Presumably, he has found himself in jail in Rome. That's the guess. We honestly don't know. We just know that he's locked up when he writes this. And as a Roman citizen, of course, he has lots of privileges and clearly sending mail and dictating things, in some cases writing it in his own hand to others to encourage this community that he's in jail for starting. It's weird, I know, but it's what happens. So let's dig into this letter, and we're going to eke over a little bit because there's some really good stuff that Paul kind of lays out in a very familiar passage that we didn't read in today's scripture, but he starts out, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ever listen to my welcomes, along with a lot of my colleagues, we normally start with something like God's grace and peace to you because that's how Paul did it. What a greeting to offer grace and peace in the name of Christ to the gathered community. And he writes, I thank God every time I remember you because of your sharing of the gospel from the first day to now. I'm confident that those, the one who began a good work, P.S. Paul, is going to be there so that you may learn and bring it to completion by the day of Christ. So Paul is basically saying, I know that the strength of our relationship, that bond we had as we shared and grew in faith, gives you ability to continue serving on behalf of the gospel. And by the way, I'm suffering for the gospel in prison, which means that y'all can do your part too because it's much worse for me. Both true and also a good little nudge to say, keep on the path. It could be a lot worse. Paul then points out specifically how, well, successful, for lack of a better term, he has been in prison teaching Romans of all people warriors and soldiers, politicians and other prisoners about the gospel and says, this persecution that's happening, this suffering that's happening to me is for the glory of God because it's still preaching the gospel, even still. It's an interesting thing to think about, although it's a dangerous trap to fall into to think that that suffering is good for you. Uh, Paul seems to revel in that, but then again, Paul also has that get out of jail free card. And so his treatment is not going to be like what many people most likely got. He goes on to say, My prayer for you is that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best so that on the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. So these two beautiful phrases, overflowing with love overflowing with love and encouraging them for a harvest of righteousness. A harvest of righteousness, which is having right relationship, being in right relationship with God through Christ, and also encouraging others in that right relationship, right? That, that relationship that is both fulfilling and gives, as Jesus says, the life abundant. 
But this overflowing of love is huge. It, it really does tell us about what Paul's ministry is, not because of Paul, but because he takes what Jesus taught and said, clearly this distilled down, love is what's essential. So if we want to learn really what Paul is saying about this overflowing with love and harvest of righteousness, we have to jump ahead to the next book to a section in the second chapter, if you will, of, of this letter, part two of seven or eight here. Um, it is known as, by some as the Christ hymn. It's a very famous passage. Uh, you've heard it before, but I want to share it one more time. If then there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love and sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. And here the hymn begins. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interest of others. Let that same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This very familiar passage in the Pauline epistles talks about how we are to live like Christ, how to imitate the life of Christ, if you will. The first part is be of that same mind. Be filled with that same love. Way back when, some of you remember, there was a trend where people wore the what would Jesus do bracelets. And while it was really just part of the Christian industrial complex selling stuff that you don't need, that question of what would Jesus do is important because Paul says if you want to live a life like Christ and have a mind like Christ, it requires love. It requires sacrifice. It requires compassion and kindness and mercy. And if the answer is what would Jesus do and it's not one of those things, you're probably not doing what Jesus is talking about. It's wildly complex but pretty simple at the same time. So he says have that same mind of Christ. Then he says don't be selfish. Be humble. Treat others as better than you, much like Jesus talks about in the story of the great banquet and other places. It's don't hold yourself as better than other people. We are all children of God, equally loved, no matter how many amazing things we do or not. He says, if you want to be like Christ, if you want to teach and preach the gospel and live in that gospel, humility is essential. Again, don't look to your own interests worry about others first. Now, this is not to say don't take care of yourself. This isn't to say self-care is not important. It is. It's 100% important. But it means you don't always think of yourself first. Now, most of us have easy way of doing this with little ones, right? A little one needs something or someone who's really struggling. You have no problem parting with something. But in general, how do we treat other people? Do we worry about what we need first and then they can get theirs after? Paul says if we're going to follow Christ, it's clear by what Christ did in all of his life that he put others before himself. He came as a servant to serve, not to be served. And then finally, Paul says, you need to empty yourself. This self-emptying love, the self-sacrificing love that says that you're willing to offer yourself in service of others. Jesus puts it in the Gospel of John, What greater love does one than to lay down his life for his friends? It's a tough path, but Paul says if you want to be part of that harvest of righteousness, if you want to be part of that overflowing love of Christ, here's four ways to do it. Here's four ways to get into it. And then Paul continues to say, and let me explain that this is back to the first one, but I'm demonstrating this in prison because I am telling you now There are other people who are preaching, probably rivals of Paul in many cases, potentially other disciples even, other people telling a message. And Paul says, I don't care if they're famous, good for them. I don't honestly care if they're doing it for the wrong reason, if it's about them and not about the gospel, so long as they're preaching that gospel of love and humility, that gospel of 
unselfish interest in taking care of others, that gospel of compassion and mercy. He said, I don't care if my rivals are more famous or have better treatment or if they have flocks of adoring crowds coming to them as long as they preach that gospel. Which leads to the question, how do you preach the gospel? How do you put the gospel into action? I'll be the first to acknowledge that words is probably not what most of us do. If you've ever had a friend of of you want to talk to you about faith uninvited, even though you're a faithful person, it's not necessarily a fun conversation, is it? Nobody likes the guy yelling at you. And not all of us can do that. I'm a lucky enough person that most of the time I hope the words that I speak are the which would help the teaching of the gospel and love. But I also am so lucky because I got to go to school for it. And not everyone has that option. There's a story where a man, a farmer, sees in the clouds, P.C. And he walks up to the priest and he says, Father, in the sky I see a sign from God. The clouds say P.C., which means the plant Christ. I'm giving up the farm and I'm going to be a preacher. And the priest says, my child, that is wonderful. However, you're a farmer. And being a farmer means you plant your fields. Maybe the P.C. means plant corn. And the man said, oh, yeah. We sometimes think that the only way to preach the gospel is to do what I do. And I will tell you now, preaching that gospel, living into the gospel in action has very little to do with someone like me most of the time. It's in the little actions you take as you love boldly and abundantly, offering love to those, especially who we pretty much sometimes say don't really deserve our love and forgiveness. It's doing things in humility, not taking credit or not receiving the praise to say, look at me what I'm doing. It's taking care of those things because it's the right thing to do when no one is looking. It's caring for others in all we do, living out that gospel, something anyone can do in any walk of life, anywhere in the world, to anyone they're around. Paul calls these people in this harvest of righteousness with this overflowing love, specifically to be of that mind of Christ, to be like Christ to all they encounter. And he tells the people in Philippi, you don't have to do what I do. You do what you do, and you do it with great love. You do it with that same mind of Christ, and you preach the gospel through your actions, through your very presence, the same way that Paul does in jail converting folks and talking to folks. The whole point, he says, is to be of that mind of Christ and take care of those around you with that love of Christ in your heart. So there's your homework. Go out and love. Find humility. Take care of others. And in all you do, be like Christ. Amen.
invite you now a time of prayer. So let us pray. God, we would ask you to be with us this day. We know whether we are gathered or scattered in your name that you promise to be with us. Help us to see your presence, to know your presence in all that we do and all who we encounter. That each person we run into each day too is a beloved child of God just as we are. We give you thanks for all of the amazing people in our lives and we give thanks that we might see your presence, the face of Christ in their very hearts. Help us to do the work you have called us to do in this world in small ways with great love. We would ask for blessings to be poured out most especially on those folks in our midst and even in ourselves who are struggling each day where life is more difficult than we wish, where things just don't feel like they should. We would ask that your spirit be poured out and comfort and peace be brought to us. Help us to remember the goodness of your grace and love. Help us to remember all of the goodness poured out for us because of the angels that we encounter in our daily lives. We would ask that you give us strength and courage for the facing of these days, that you would Help us to walk the path you have laid before us that we might spread more love, more joy, more peace, more kindness and compassion and mercy in this world. That we may be a light in the darkness for all of your people to point to the joy and love of your son, Jesus Christ. For all these blessings, God, we give thanks in your name and we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, my friends, as you go out into the world, be of that same mind of Christ. Love boldly and abundantly. Live in humility around others. Treat others, not just as you'd like to be treated, but even better than you'd like to be treated. Care for those around you and be like Christ, the hands and feet of the risen one for all you encounter. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.